This is Today's Business Leaders, actionable advice from real-world professionals. And now, here's your host, Gabe Arnold. All right, today on my show, I have Ben Menatucci, and um, he's the uh, founder of Xena Marketing. And uh, so we're going to talk to him about entrepreneurship. We're going to see if there's anything cool happening over there in Seattle, and we're going to have a conversation like we always do. So welcome to the show, Ben. Awesome. Thanks for having me on, Dave. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So as everybody knows, and you know now, um, all I ever ask in the beginning is, uh, when did you first realize that you were an entrepreneur? I think the first time I realized that I was an entrepreneur, and it's kind of interesting, like there's a time when I like chose to be one, and then there's a time where I realized like that I wasn't really cut out to like work a job. Um, and that was actually when I was 18 or 19 years old, and I, I quit the job that I was working on a two week heads up, which wasn't necessarily the best thing for them because I was in the management position. I went to sell door to door, and I sold door to door sales for two years um, because. You know, I wanted to be able to control my income, and, and uh, I felt like that was like the right choice at the time. What What were you selling door to door? I sold pest control. Nice. And how old are you now? I'm 24. You sound very experienced for being 24. And there's this weird trend on my show that I literally did not plan and never had an idea, but 90% of the guests I've had on have done door to door sales. Yep. I noticed that with a lot of entrepreneurs, it's a really common, I think a lot of people go through that stage where for me, it was like, you know, I'm tired of like spending my time to make money. So I wasn't enjoying what I was doing. There was not really opportunity for growth. I didn't want to go to school. I tried, I just didn't have any passion for it. Uh, I loved to learn on my own. I still always am reading and doing online courses, but never the traditional way. Um, yeah. Then I was like, well, I want to go make money like the way I want to do it, which is selling. So I'll go sell door to door because I can control that. And then eventually I was like, well, why am I selling for these people building their foundation when I could be doing it for myself? Mm -hmm. I started my business. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah I, I started my, my construction company was the first thing I did and that was door to door sales. Basically you, I, I figured out how to generate leads and buy leads and then you go and pitch in person. And like, yeah. it's a huge part of like figuring out to sell on top of it. I hung around my grandfather. He was like, actually, he raised me basically and uh, was more of a dad, you know, than my dad. And I watched him sell. He could sell anything to anybody anytime. So I had that and I was like, oh, I could do this. And I went and did that for quite a few years. And it definitely, it's, an, it, it's a pretty interesting path. I, I, I'm totally unemployable too, so I can relate. But I, I never, I never quit my job to go do door-to-door -door sales. I just kind of landed in it. So when people tell me they quit their job to go do door-to-door -door sales, I have the utmost respect for it because I know what it's like. And I think that's pretty ballsy. <laughs> it was totally crazy. I was, uh, I was 18, almost 19. And I was uh, managing a ski rack installation shop here in Seattle called Rack and Road. And I'd just been promoted after working there for a year to be manager. <laughs> This guy, this guy who I knew had been selling door to door. He's like, you'd be really good at it. He's like, the season actually starts in two weeks. So you have to make your decision real quick. And I thought about it. I made my decision. I drove down there with like a hundred bucks in my bank account. Uh, and I did it and like threw myself in the water. Actually, my business partner who with, with Zima, the co-founder, he actually went with me. We did it together, which is super cool. That's awesome. <laughs> I <laughs> It's like I said, there's just these weird patterns I noticed. That's why I'm laughing is that the other thing that um, I had somebody on a few weeks ago, they're like, I just got promoted because I'd worked my ass off and then I quit. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> like, really apparently that's, a, yeah, apparently really that's the thing to do. Oh, <laughs> I, um, I can relate to that because I, I did have three jobs for like nine or 10 months apiece and, I'm, I, and then I would quit. But after I bombed out on my first business, totally screwed it up and lost it. Um, I was like, well, I need to make some money in the, in the meantime. So I went and worked for um, an auto repair company. I won't, I won't name them, but in the interviews, they're, I have aced the interviews. They're like, dude, we want to hire you. And they're like, you're going to make $65,000 a year. And I was like, ah, that's, that's not too bad. I, it was a reduction from what I was making when I was working myself. That's okay. I was young. I'm like, I can survive on that. So I get to like month six or seven and I asked and I became assistant manager and I was going to become a manager and take over a store. And uh, I asked my boss who was a manager and been there for 20 years, how much he made. 
and I quit two weeks later. <laughs> yeah, because there's just no potential. <laughs> because what they told me, of course, wasn't going to happen. Um, and what he was making, I was like, oh, my God, dude. That's like, to me, that's like below the poverty line. <laughs> so yeah. it wasn't that bad. But I, but it, I was just like, it's super hard for me. If, if something happened, I would totally get a job. I can I could do it for a little while. Yeah, but you hard, do what you're going to do. Yeah, like you'll totally say, but it'd be so hard for me to go. I could probably easily go make twenty five or thirty dollars an hour, which is not bad money. No. But the problem, the problem is, in like two hours right now, I can make you know what most people make in two or three weeks, and I don't, I don't mean that to brag, but it's just like it's it's mentally hard to consider something like that when you know yeah. what it's like to work for yourself. Yes, yeah, so it feels like a waste <laughs> of time to go and do the other thing. Yeah. So. <laughs> Like, it's because it's that, that like thing where it's like guaranteed to make that small amount of money, but then yep. on the upside, like you know, and if you hustle hard enough, it doesn't matter what you're selling, what you're doing. If you just surely try hard enough over and over and over again, it doesn't matter. You will make it. Just there's no way you won't. So yeah, the thing is, I guess we're gonna get along fine, man. <laughs> I love I love what you just said. I always tell people like I'm not worried. Like you can't kill me. Like yeah. if you literally kill me. I'll be good. Like you can blow up anything I'm doing and I could outwork you and survive. <laughs> and the thing is too, you probably enjoy doing it. I do. Yeah. It's like dare me, dare me to not be successful. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's true though. It's the fire inside. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Well, cool. So, so you go do that. You go do door to door sales with the guy that's now your co-founder, which is awesome. Um, yeah. Take us from there and catch us up to, uh, where you are today with the agency and kind of how you landed there and, and how things are going. Yeah. So, um, did door to door sales for one year in Salt Lake city. Um, and then I went back out by myself the next year. Um, and I led a team in Austin, Texas. And then from there I went to Miami, Florida where I helped them open up an office, a brand new branch. Um, mm. and then what I did was I actually was selling life insurance for Massachusetts mutual at the same time as selling door to door. So I got licensed in these States and I would like kind of try and do both things. So on the weekends I'd go network, try and sell life insurance, which I was able to do. And then on the weekdays I'd knock doors. Um, and then I actually was hit by a car when I was out working, uh, a guy ran a stop sign, hit me, totally messed up my back. I'm all good now. Um, but for a period of time I was not able to knock doors and I was like, okay, what am I going to do to make money? My, my best friend and my business partner, Brennan, has always been extremely good with affiliate marketing um, and then online advertising. He just, since we were young, he started a DJ business where he's DJing weddings and he advertised that with Google AdWords when it first came out. He's always good at that kind of stuff. And I was like, hey, you know, how can we team up? Like, you're really good at this online sales. I'm really good at in-person sales. Maybe we can start a business where we're going to businesses and helping them do what you do. And so I yeah. just started doing B2B. I took my door-to-door -door skills and I just went into businesses all over Florida because I was living in Miami. And the, the weird thing was I actually ended up getting this client uh, in Hialeah, Florida, which is not necessarily like the area you want to be walking around doing B2B in. Uh, <laughs> it was like this warehouse and I had looked it up online and I emailed the guy a couple of times and I was like, I'm just going to go and try and talk to him because I know we can do a lot for him. So I went and I waited outside his office for an hour. It was like 80 degrees. I wore like a suit. I was like sweating through the suit. Totally sucked. Finally, the dude shows up. Talked to him for like two or three hours, and I walk out of there with a $1,000 check, uh, which was my first client. It was small. It was $1,000 a month, uh, which you know, now our clients are much larger, but it was, it was really cool to have that experience uh, and work with them, and we helped them out a lot. So. And then from there, so fast forward two and a half years um, here in Seattle. Um, running my, my business kind of out of this apartment here but downtown Bellevue um, as well as like across the street there's an office space called WeWork that we use a lot um, mm -hmm. so there's 31 clients doing online advertising branding web design um, don't really do much SEO mostly paid advertising mm -hmm. uh, it's creative media as well so we partner with some really cool uh, companies that do really great videography and um, they're you know they're very talented down, down in LA actually and actually fly up here to shoot for our clients and things like that. So it's kind of getting more into the creative side. Uh, recently through two events, one of them was um, at the Showbox Market in Bellevue. Um, one of our clients had rented out the entire venue, which is a really big venue. Um, we advertised the event on Facebook. We had 399 people come from Facebook ads within a two-week period of time, which is pretty cool to be able to drive that much traffic. Um, and then another event in the penthouse of the building I, I live in right now, 
they had a big uh, launch party for a podcast or a radio station here in Seattle. So we helped bring catering and doing all that. Um, which events, I got to say events, they're really difficult to plan and they're really, really stressful. Um, but when you actually have the event happen successfully and you're there, not only like celebrating with the people, but you're like, wow, I put this all together and I totally pulled my hair out in the process, but everyone's having fun. Like it's totally worth it. That's awesome. I was, I helped a friend of mine with his first event in March and it, with the way you just said it is exactly right. You're, it's stressful and scary and it's a mess. And then when it all comes together and works, you're like, oh my God, this is the best thing I ever did. <laughs> yeah, it really is. I mean, the cool thing is like, not only are you, because you, you said even yourself, you like to bring people together, mm-hmm. but like doing these big events, you're doing it on a massive scale. You know, we're bringing 300, 400 people into a room. They're making new friends, you know, it's cool. You get to look through all the photos from the event afterwards. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Very cool. So, so you do just a lot of digital, all different things, video, web, creative, Facebook ads and traffic and all that and events yeah. too. Huh? What I, I kind of tell people to make it simple is there's two things that are really important with, with um, generating business online, at least for the strategy that I use. So number one, we have targeted advertising, which is, I'm sure as you know, you know data analysis and p- figuring out which people are ready to buy from what market based on what they're currently doing online. Now that's, that's step one. Step two is actually having the content that resonates with them. Because if you have that ad that's going right in front of the right buyer who's looking for that exact car, or looking for a home, or looking to buy a pair of shoes online, and you don't have the content that, makes, that speaks to them, then they won't buy. So it's really important to have both. It's a two-part equation. Um, and I learned that through trial and error through experience where you know when I first started out, I was doing a lot of e-commerce business. Um, and if your content isn't going to go with the consumers, you will make no sales and you could yeah. have, you could retarget people 50 million times who have looked at that product. And if the, the photo on the Shopify store sucks and the photo on the inside of Facebook sucks, you don't have any video content. It's not going to do anything. No matter how much ad spend you make, your ROI will not be positive. So it's super <laughs> important to, uh, to include content in there. And that's actually fun because it's creative too. So it's like, you got to have a little fun creating the videos and working with people to, to show their vision onto a camera. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So I have a couple of questions. Um, one, I want to get back to that and talk about your process there because you totally nailed it and you're totally right. But first, um, I want to ask something. I asked somebody on the show this the other day, what's different between you, you're a millennial, I'm not, I'm 35, so you're like 10 or plus years younger than me. What's the difference between what everybody is seeing and calling the millennial generation and you who obviously knows how to work hard and super smart and gets results and you're very young? I think it just comes back to like people make generalizations about things and like Mm -hmm. the masses because like I can tell you I for one, like all my friends who are millennials, they're all similar to me because I only associate with people who share similar aspirations and obviously I have friends who are doing other things, but for the most part, they have the same morals and principles as me. So I don't really see the like millennial stuff that everyone talks about because I just don't go near it because I don't want to be a part of it. Um, yeah. But I think the difference is like, I grew up in like a, this area of Bellevue is like really business savvy, very wealthy. Like Microsoft's here, we have Amazon, you know, Salesforce has a headquarters like right here behind me, Colin mm-hmm. Kirk, Expedia back here, all these huge companies. I grew up here in this area, uh, never in a family that was like necessarily financially struggling, but never was a, one of the kids who had everything and was always had, had you know, like I had, I had to work for everything that I had. I you know, did chores to have my cell phone. I had my first job when I was 16 at a grocery store, worked in a restaurant. Like I worked my way up. And I think uh, because I was around so much wealth, my standards were really, really high from living, but I never had anything handed to me. So I always had the work ethic of like, I want to go fucking get that. And like, what can I do today to make sure that tomorrow I'm closer? And I think that's kind of how it happened. I thank my parents for that. Now they don't live here. They live in Arizona. Gotcha. Um, but I think growing up here really instilled that. I, I definitely feel like it, that was part of it. Also, I think it's just kind of like some people are naturally more driven than others. I mm-hmm. think. Um, I don't necessarily know why or what goes into that, but I do have a lot of like natural, just like, let's go. Great answer. <laughs> yeah, no, I just, I'm always curious. And that it, it's, that's interesting that you share, like you were exposed to wealth, but not necessarily wealthy. Yeah. It's a, it's, I think exposure 
at certain points in our life, kids, young adults, whatever, I think the exposure that we choose or that we accidentally get, like obviously you didn't choose to be born there, you're just born there. Um, but I think the, what we get and what we choose to expose ourselves to is huge. Um, and it's interesting that you recognize that too. So very cool. And yeah, I, someday I'd like to figure out how, why some people are super driven and why others aren't. I don't know why though either. I think it's like somewhat like nature, somewhat nurture. Mm -hmm. Like I think there's opportunity for both to play a big role in it. But I also do think it's like naturally personality types, you know, yeah. like type A personality versus other types of personalities. Um, mm -hmm. I also think it comes down to a lot, a lot of like who people associate with. Cause even, you know, myself, if I'm hanging out with a friend who I've maybe have had that friend for a really long time and they're not very focused or grounded and, you know, they're always kind of screwing off or going out drinking and whatever. And I start spending a lot of time with them. I'll notice myself kind of falling off track and it doesn't mean I shouldn't have them in my life. It just means I shouldn't have them in my life regularly because it's not in alignment with my goals. So I think a lot of it is like recognizing, you know, who you should be around, what you should be in like, incorporating into your life in order to make sure you stay on track because at the end of the day it's like it's my responsibility to make sure that I take care of myself and that I do the things I need to do to keep myself where I want to be and even like one of my mentors and we were just talking about this like there's this thing where there's like and he he's an older guy and he doesn't really like go on social media so I don't think he actually I think he came up with this on his own although Gary V or so Ty Lopez all these people they've been saying it for a while but there's entrepreneur and entrepreneur and my mentor his name's Chuck super successful uh, and you know tons of different things but he started actually building a big construction company was, was kind of his first deal he's also like written uh, tv shows down in hollywood and a lot of cool things but he always goes he always goes you know entrepreneur entrepreneur and what he means by that is like entrepreneurs are people who you have no one else to blame but yourself because at the end of the day you're the one that's responsible for producing results and then there's other people who they have this like you know something goes wrong and it's like you know, it's kind of this because of that, but it's like, no, at the end of the day, it's your job. It's my job. And I think taking self like accountability and ownership of things, that's really like the first thing to do in order to figure out like how to get where you want to be. Gold, man. I totally agree. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. If you take ownership of it, then you can, you can impact it, change, you can adjust decisions, you can deal with a bad situation or a good one. That's, you're totally right. And I love the, I love the visual. That's awesome. Because <laughs> you see it, you see it all the time. It's like, you know. That's what, yeah, that's what a entrepreneur does. And everybody encounters those people and you'll encounter those people as clients or friends or whoever, or people that claim that they're in business and they're not, if they're not taking total ownership for what's going on in whatever role they're in. Not if, not just if you're the owner, but if you're manager or whatever, you take total ownership and you will grow and succeed. You blame others and you're at the whims and will of everybody else, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, it's totally true. Yeah. Um, I think it's also interesting, like you see a lot of people, especially with, with what I'm doing, like making bids on for websites or projects, things like that. And I have friends who are in the industry, you know, somewhat competitors, although they're not, but we could overlap working on certain projects. And, you know, we're talking to each other and I'll hear like, you know, I didn't get that project or this and that. And it's like, what, you know, oh, why didn't it go through? And they're like, well, the business, this, the business, that. But like what I usually try to do, and I'm not saying I'm perfect, like, but a lot of times when I don't get a deal, I look at it, I always go back to like, how did I build the value? And what did I miss when explaining to them what they need in order yeah. to get it to where they need to make the purchase? And that's the one big thing too, is like always evaluating, like, it's not, you don't want to be too self-critical because that can like, you know, actually be damaging, but it is also important to be like very like, you know, review yourself, check yourself. Like, what did I do about this that I could have done better? Not because yeah. you're thinking on yourself, but just because you're like wanting to improve. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. You should, you should evaluate everything and especially your failures because your failures are your most valuable thing. But, you know, you always want to, you know, evaluate everything and say like, oh, what do we do right? What do we do wrong? I, I was working with this big company um, like three or four years ago and my client who I shouldn't have been working for in the first place, or I was working with this big company. My client killed the contract, broke their contract, went out of business. So that kind of sucked. Um, <laughs> and then I lost a bunch of money. And then I sat down with my vendor who was helping me and they're like, Hey, can you, can you or actually call me? He's like, can you come in for a postmortem and let's review the project? And they're like, we do this on every single project, good or bad. I was like, oh, 
Like it's just really eye opening to be like, you should do that, you know, no matter what, so that you can, um, you know, improve. So, you know, it's, you're totally right. Not make the same mistake twice. Yeah. I feel like it's really easy to do well in life. If you just learn from your mistakes or even, even further than that, other people's like the best thing is when you see someone else do something and you learn from it and then you encounter that situation and you implement what you saw them do or you, or what they didn't do in order to like get past it. I think that's good. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier kind of your, some of the things that you said, like you're never going to be successful if you're sending, if you're in front of the wrong audience with the wrong message or you're in front of the right audience with the wrong message. And then you talk about kind of how you develop content and you help people really get it. And you said something really interesting, I'll, I'll probably paraphrasing what you said. You like to bring out people's creativity or bring out people something in front of the camera. What, what did you say? Yeah. So like bringing their vision onto the camera. Okay. I think there's like a lot of business owners and um, even with my own business, I see this where like, you're so close to it every day. You're like this. And it's like, when you're so close to the piece of paper, you can only see the center and not the edges. Right. So yeah. it's like, you want to try and bring other people in for things that, that they might be better at, or, you know, get these creative ideas going because sometimes it's just like little tweaks that I have or like little things that I know I can talk to a business owner and the way that they're trying to convey their business. It's like just one simple little thing, like with the way they're phrasing it or the structure of how they're trying to present themselves. And, and then it totally changes things. But it's really great to like take video content because video is by far the best way to market or engage with people right now in terms of the results that I've seen in my business and also some of the statistics that I've been reading. Um, but you get emotion, you get people engaged. Uh, there's a lot to it. And you can also educate people. So it's like the three E's. My business partner, they own Viral Media LA. Might be a good person for you to talk to at some point. Uh, yeah. for the podcast. But they do evoke emotion, uh, engage, and then educate. The three E's that video does better than any other type of content. Um, and I think it's totally true that that happens. So it's like when you get someone on the camera, it's also fun and it's an asset for their business. So you just totally, it's like a good time. Some people get nervous, but you got to like, you know, yeah. break the ice and have them laugh. And, you know, the first time I was on camera, I stuttered and I was nervous too. So it's like, you just have to like not think about it, you know? Yeah, for sure. I was shooting video with a client in LA a few weeks ago and I'll share this cause it might be interesting. You may, you probably already know this, but it might be interesting or useful. And we realized that we were shooting content for a course and a couple ads. And like, I totally agree with you about video. It's just way more powerful. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to like lead him and make him feel comfortable cause he hadn't done a ton of video before. And he's just brilliant, brilliant guy. And like one of the most interesting people you could talk to in person. Um, but you know, video is a new format. Like you said, some people get, nervous and he said like making them laugh which is definitely a good point so I realized in the middle of shooting these co- video courses that I could engage with my eyes and my face and and get him to c- continue to interact with me without me talking to him so I was sitting behind the camera and I was just like just like you're doing now you're like totally paying attention to what I'm saying yeah. and I was just doing it all non-verbally and I could guide him through the videos just with my face it was the weirdest thing that's cool that's non-verbal communication it's like that's a good skill. <laughs> I'm reading, um, or I just finished Never Split the Difference. Yep. Um, and in there, he's, it's like 735, 50 something. I forget the last number. And it's like 7% of communication is audible. Mm-hmm. Uh, 35 is tone of voice and 50 whatever is body language. So it's kind of interesting to yeah, mess with that. Right. There's actually a book that I read. I've read it like four times now. Uh, cause it's a very good book and I read it when I was selling door to door. I was actually given it by the CEO of the company I was working for, um, which was Altera Pest Control, now Active Environmental. We also do marketing for them, which is kind of cool. Nice. But they, uh, he gave me this book. It's called What Everybody Is Saying. And it's by, um, a FBI agent who is very successful in solving a lot of big crimes. Nice. Uh, he talks about like how he would interrogate people. And he would like look for nonverbal cues and he was able to solve a lot of crimes because of paying attention and picking up on those things. And what I used it for when I was selling door to door was to tell when people are smoke screen or, you know, they're not actually being serious to me or to pick up on how they're feeling about conversation. Cause when you first, first meet someone, like you're trying to sell them something within like a 20 minute 
time span or sometimes even less. So it's super important that everything you do is on point, including the way your body language is. So like I learned a ton of cool things. Like one of the coolest things that I've learned and it helps both like with dating and with business and with getting friends, everything. When you're talking to a male that you haven't met before, you shouldn't be squared. Like you don't want your shoulders squared because that's confrontational. That's like subconsciously alpha. If you're mm-hmm. talking to you, so you want your male, you want to be like this kind of angled. With a female, you actually do want to be squared up because just like the way that humans are programmed, that's how they respond best to new connections. Uh, and so that was a cool, really cool thing that I learned. There's also a ton of other little body language tricks that I learned. There's nice. like things you can do to trigger other people to make things like, like head nodding in sales. Like you head nod and people start head nodding and then they're like agreeing with you subconsciously and then they start doing it through verbal. It's cool. So that's what I would say like anyone watching, if you want to take your sales game to the next level or just understand people, that's a good book to read. I'm reading it, dude. I love stuff like that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll, maybe the next episode we'll have you come on and just teach us all that stuff. That'd be fun. Yeah, definitely. Dan, I love to do that kind of stuff. <laughs> that's awesome. I, yeah, I've, I've studied a ton of, uh, ton of things like that because it's all the little subtleties that add up to the whole picture and it's really interesting and um there was a show on i think it was on netflix but it was i think it was called faces it had john cleese in it yeah i think i've seen that it's really cool i was gonna say check that out you'd love it if if not it's just like really interesting about yeah how we how we act and they this one study and that i've read in other books and he cited in there they could predict with like 85% accuracy or some high number. I forget the number, but it was very high accuracy, which couples were getting divorced simply by putting them in a room, putting them on camera. And they had predictors. They could tell based on the facial, no, no audible. They could tell by the facial expressions who was getting divorced and they were right. Just by body language. And yeah, because there was one, I only remember one of the cues, but one of them was like, the man does something that I forget. I don't know why I forget that one, but women would turn their mouth down with like um, disdain or like it was a little sign of hate or the right word is escaping me that they were using Um, resentment. Like they could, they could detect resentment. There's a specific facial expression that we all use for that. Apparently. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, There's a couple of things like uh, another one that I, I always used to is like, and you can't, you can't say that just like one of these things happening means like X, but if you pick up on different things happening over the course of the conversation, you can come to the conclusion confidently that like this is what it is. So like if you're talking to a female and she starts touching like this part of her body or maybe her ears or her hair, it means she feels exposed because if you think of like this, this region of your body is one of the most vital areas of your entire body. So like huh. they're protecting themselves, right? So she's playing with her necklace or like touching right here. Like this is your jugular vein. This is right. like you try to protect yourself. So it's subconscious like feeling exposed. Another one is pupils dilating. Mm-hmm. So pupils dilate. People actually, when you talk to someone you're attracted to or that you're happy to see, your pupils will dilate. It's because your brain releases dopamine when you're happy to see people. Um, and so if you see these things happening in unison, Another one is like, if you want to tell if someone's like being standoffish or uncomfortable, or you feel like they're hiding something from you, close body language. So like crossing the legs, a lot of people don't look for this, but if you're sitting in a chair at a meeting and someone is, you're asking them questions and they have their legs crossed and maybe they're leaning forward, they're like kind of ex- like protecting themselves. And um, that's actually a sign that there's something that they may be hiding um, or, you know, that they're feeling very uncomfortable with what's going on. Uh, and the, obviously you can't just take one thing and say this is happening, but you have to like look for these different things over the course of conversation. And then by the end, when it's time to close or time to change the direction of things, you have a good idea of how they're feeling, even though they haven't told you yet. And that's it's super interesting to me. You articulate it very well because it's something that I really study and pay attention to. And it's not something I talk a lot about. So you're totally, I'm totally engaged. Well, that's awesome. <laughs> I think it's fascinating. Like if I were to have gone to school, I would have probably done um, psychology. Um, and I think that plays a lot into psychology. Recently I've been really fascinated with purchase behavior and like hmm. different psychological things that humans overcome during the process. So like I have this kind of, and it's not unique to me. I know I've seen other marketers do it, but I think the way that I draw this diagram out is, is pretty unique to, to me and my brand. But we have like the awareness, consideration, decision-making stages of marketing. And mm-hmm. you can actually create video content to guide people through that. So you target cold traffic, which would be people just qualified, 
based on their activity online and their interests with the awareness stage, which is purely value-based video. And you're optimized for video views, not cost per click. And you set triggers in the video. So once they hit X amount of seconds watched, it automatically sets the next video up to be shown within 24 hours. Um, that way you're like subconsciously answering the questions that they have before they have them. So first it's like, you know, maybe if you're a chiropractor, you're doing stretches to relieve sciatic nerve pain. Someone watches that for 60 seconds and the average attention span is only four seconds on Facebook. You know they're interested. So you show them the second video. The second video is talking about the chiropractor and, you know, showing how the process works, who they are, how long they've been doing it, what their clients look like when they're working with them, showing people happy, all these subconscious things. And that's the consideration stage. Then the final stage, you use testimonial carousels and you actually put an urgency, like, you know, come in for your free adjustment or whatever, and you get them to click and opt in for the ad. Um, and it's using the same, like, principles of purchase behavior and, like, buying psychology. All that stuff is, like, totally fascinating to me. And it's <laughs> yeah. Uh, what you just described is gold, man. That's a, that's a really simple way of explaining what, what other people try to confuse, either because they don't understand it or they don't want to share it. <laughs> so. <laughs> And it's just so interesting because like the biggest thing I found like being a kind of like an online consultant, I guess, uh, people are just overcomplicated. So like when you meet in person for like a meeting, like when I'm selling to my clients, the way that it goes is we have our introduction meeting. Usually it's pretty short. It might be 15 to 30 minutes. And that's just getting to know if I even want to work with them, if they like me, if they have you know the same, uh, if they're looking for the things that I provide. And then, and then that is like introduction awareness stage content right so if you're online and that's the advertising funnel this is your awareness stage where they're becoming aware of something um just gotta mute this call um if, if then the second meeting would be the consideration where you know I've, i'll come to the meeting i've put together my presentation the strategies i think that will work best for them we're going over how everything works what i've accomplished as a marketer what my team has accomplished and then that's their consideration stage and then the next time you know you leave that with them to consider the next meeting, you come together to see what's best for them. They're either going to tell you yes or no. Right there, that's the same as the online advertising funnel, right? So as a financial planner, you know, the only thing that I didn't do this in was door-to-door -door sales because that's like direct response where you're just like going out blasting people. Yeah. Uh, numbers game. You talk to 100 people a day, you might sell seven accounts, right? Just because it's numbers. But that's where people get messed up is like online, same principles as in person. Different. Yep. From you. That's all. Awesome. <laughs> um, I got questions. I got a question about that, but have you ever read Kevin Mitnick? Uh -uh, I haven't. Go look up his books and read his stuff. You'll love it. Okay. That's where I learned most of my social hacking and social intelligence. So um, he, he, uh, he got caught by the FBI and then they hired him. <laughs> That's cool. He's a lot good. Yeah, he he's phenomenal. Um, now he owns a security auditing company or something. But anyway, yeah. um, I've I uh, let's just uh, let me say it the way that it would be a wise way to say it. I know people who have tried everything that he wrote about in his book. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, it's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, so my question is, what you just descri described in the video process, which I. Um, totally agree with you know what you have there um, is what I would call like relationship marketing attraction marketing inbound marketing which I'm 1 million percent for I love it marketing. yeah um, then you mentioned which is a great totally true clear example door-to-door -door is direct response marketing and like cold outreach and the different path right I simultaneously all the time dedicate about half my time to both channels because I've done cold outreach so much that I love it. It's a game to me. It's a lot of fun. Do you not at this point, cause you've experienced both and obviously very good at both. Do you now have a preference for inbound or for direct response and why? I use them together. So, um, for my personal business, um, Zima marketing, I actually do the same strategies that I use for my clients to get myself clients. So I know that they work and I can show people that when I, you know, I, I eat my own medicine. Yeah. Uh, but what I do is I actually have automated email campaigns that go out. Um, and I also do like LinkedIn marketing, um, direct response, email, stuff like that. That's been really successful for us. Um, and I, I, I take people from the messages, um, sometimes to a landing page, sometimes to a Calendly. 
but whatever they go, I'm able to record that with pixels uh, and then I retarget them with content marketing strategies. So even if it's a direct response, you know, and I, it's a cold outreach, that person engages with it and they schedule a call with me for Tuesday and it was, you know, Friday or today, they're most likely going to see a video or an ad from my business in between the time that they schedule the call and we actually speak because I want them to warm up, see report. And the thing is, that's kind of crazy is a lot of consumers don't realize that that's an ad. Like a lot of consumers will click on something from my business or your business or from Amazon, and then they'll just see it on the internet and they don't know why. They just see it. They, you know, you don't know what you don't know. So they're just like, wow, you know, wow, this is really a big company. I, you know, I've seen stuff all over the place. And like, it's like, well, I'm actually retargeting you and paying money to do that. But <laughs> it really works. I've had people say the same thing to me even without retargeting because i i'm pretty aggressive on lots of fronts but they're like you're everywhere it's obviously retargeting and just yeah. like general outreach and stuff but it's the funniest thing when people say that i'm like no i'm just following you around yeah <laughs> I, just, I just know what i'm doing yeah yeah that's, that's very cool i was uh told a statistic i think it was so it used it used to kind of be like people would typically close or agree for meetings after like you know between three to five outreaches and now it's actually seven to nine that I that I've seen on on average in 2018. Like, and that's you know including cold calling or emails or whatever. You got to reach out seven to nine times to break through the barrier. Um, so I think like just from a retargeting standpoint, for me like I like sales. I don't like contacting people when I'm not getting a response. And I think that's natural and it's just something you deal with. But if I can automate that process with retargeting or pay, you know five bucks a day to contact 50 people with retargeting ads or a hundred people any day I do that because it yeah. saves me time and I don't have to go doing these things that I feel are tedious. You are fucking brilliant. You know that, right? <laughs> well, I know you're doing the same thing. So. No, you are absolutely fucking brilliant, dude. Appreciate you, it. you really get it. And I can always tell when people know what they're doing and are super smart because they break it down in a simple way that literally anybody can understand. Yeah. Posers always throw up the smoke screen of a bunch of bullshit terms and complex stuff that they don't understand, let alone they can't make you understand it either. Yeah. That's what it's all about is being simple. You know, I have a brother who's 12. I think he's almost 13. Uh, he lives in Arizona and he's, you know, he likes to hear about what I'm doing in my business and he's a cool, he's a really cool, very smart kid. And like, what I love is I love being able to like explain things to him and then like I explain it to him what I'm doing. He understands how Facebook advertising works he wants us to get into e-commerce and do stuff like that. So it's like uh, being able to explain it to my little brother and then turn around and talk to a client. I do it the same way because I'm like, if he can get it that way, they're going to get it that way. So it only took me 20 years to figure out what you know, just so you know. Well, <laughs> I think I'm a lot of it was mentorship and uh, I don't know, I guess, you know, taking a lot of information. Yeah. Also, it's, it's at the point where like, I feel like with online online stuff, um, a lot of people try to be experts. And I'd say, yes, there are some people who are way more experienced than others. But in terms of like experts, it's pretty tough to claim that because, uh, you know, Facebook right now, the advertising platform is going and doing backflips, all sorts of weird stuff. You know, I have friends who have a million dollar plus revenue e-commerce stores whose ad accounts are going missing and things are totally just getting totally fucked up. So yep. For someone to claim that they're an expert in something that isn't even solidified and like functioning properly, it's like, you know, that's bullshit to me. <laughs> I like that, man. <laughs> Facebook hasn't even created a platform that they're experts in yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that is so right. <laughs> yeah. Have you seen that happening with people's getting their ad accounts deleted? My Zima marketing ad account was missing and we had to call and get, get it back from support. I was like, I'm I woke not, up in the morning. I was like, what the fuck? Where's my ad account? I haven't had anything go missing, but I had randomly 65 of my ad accounts shut down. Wow. And they're like, they could never tell me why. And it took me 10 days of harassing them, basically. And then everything worked again. Yeah. <laughs> like, so it wasn't missing, but it didn't matter because it, it might as well have been missing. Yeah. <laughs> so, I had to go back to every single customer and say, so you guys know, here's what's going on. Everything's a fucking disaster. I'm just right. going to be upfront with you and tell you, we have no idea what's going on. Their only line to me was that they were like, well, it looks like you logged into the ad account from a new location. So we had to shut them down for security reasons. I'm like, really? 
I have two factor on my account. There's only one person that can get into my account. <laughs> You're adding like a security phone call in, you know, no matter what time of the day. And that's what Google yeah. does. Yeah. So it's like, that's bullshit. It, you know, it was me because there's only one person in the world that has that code and I used it to get in. <laughs> But reading data out of their back end, trying to hide the stuff they've been doing in their Excel. Oops, wrong, wrong account in the trash can. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, those are always exciting times. Oh, but, but yeah, no, it's, it's oh my god, I, I love what you said. Nobody's an expert. <laughs> You're totally right. <laughs> it's changing every single day. There's new things coming out, new strategies. Buyers are getting you know, conditioned to one type of marketing because they're seeing it overused. So you got to figure out a new strategy. Um, what I've been doing and something that I think is kind of setting what I do apart from other online advertisers is I'm actually starting to lean away from using Facebook as much. I use it as a great way to uh, generate cold traffic because the targeting is really awesome. Um, and then retargeting on other platforms. So like uh, YouTube, especially for mortgage and real estate, I've been doing a lot of mortgage. Um, Mortgage, well, I'd say like 60 to 70% of our leads are coming from YouTube ads, which are video wow. based ads, which is pretty big. If you, know, if you think about like, if you go to a company that's only doing Facebook and you're spending money on Facebook ads and that's the only place they're looking for their business, you know, then you, you're totally leaving all that money on the table for the other platforms. And yeah. if you look at the nature of the platforms, actually, YouTube is much more the type of place you want to go to find people for professional services because there's so many how-to videos. People are looking up, you know, how to buy a home or what are, you know, and then they're watching these videos of people explaining different things to consider. Well, what better time than to place your video ad right in between the, the first video and the next one they're about to watch. Yeah, no kidding. It's definitely a higher action intent. It's not necessarily buyer intent, like you said, but it's totally like, how do I figure this out? Whereas I always tell people, Facebook is just hanging out on the front porch with their neighbors. Yep. That's, that's and eventually if you kick people enough they'll get off the porch but you gotta kick them a lot of times <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. that's a really good analogy yeah cause, and, and that's because I don't I mean I obviously get on Facebook every day all the time because it's part of my business and life but yeah. as a per, as an individual not as a business owner which is you know hard to split that personality out of me but I go on there to see like pictures of my nieces and nephews because they're cute and that's yeah. like, if I wasn't on Facebook or business that's literally all I would do on Facebook <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah. Uh, that's really interesting. So there's a professor here at the Seattle University who's writing um, a big study on like the strategies used to promote fake news and like whether or not the media platforms that are allowing those, those fake news articles to be distributed should be held responsible or if it should be back on the actual people who created the articles. Um, and so I've actually been helping him out, uh, kind of helping him understand some of the regulations and policies that Facebook has. And uh, one of the things that we are talking about uh, was what Facebook was created for initially, which is exactly what you said, like hanging out with your friends and family. And I almost feel like potentially if Facebook wants to maintain the value that it was initially created for and continue to be such a powerhouse, I feel like they got to kind of go back to square one at some point. Um, yeah. because I always notice in my life and in my business when things are getting overcomplicated and not working out, you go back to the basics. And that kind of seems like what's happening over at Facebook. And I'm obviously in no position to make judgments, tell them what to do, but it's just something that I feel like potentially could be the next best move for them. I think you're right. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a, this theory called the origins theory mm -hmm. um, that I've called it that. I don't know if there's another one out there called that, but that's my theory. And the origins theory is that it's virtually impossible to be successful outside of a space that was not related to your origin. And I always, I always use Google as the poster child for my theory because how many social networks has Google tried to launch that fucking blow? Yeah, that's true. Google, this is probably before your time, but Google Wave um, was their Twitter. Google Plus is obviously their Facebook, which is a total joke. It's good for SEO, but it's a total joke. Um, and the, but everything that Google touches that was related to search is, turns to gold. So... Gmail is search, Google, you know, Google Drive and Docs is search, you know, obviously their main Google, you know, anything they do like in communication and in search, like around that, they kill it. Yeah. And then the fix to that, in my opinion, is what they did realize, I think, or at least I think they realized is they formed Alphabet and now they have other companies. Starting a new company, you can do something new. It's the origin of the idea. It's the origin of the team. It's like brand new. 
But what you just said about Facebook really reminded me of that because Facebook is going to continue to get in trouble when they try to get outside of their origin. Yeah. Um, but when they stick to their origin, they're going to be successful and grow. Yeah. Um, and it'll be really interesting to see what happens with this dating app that I keep hearing about from Facebook because I, I don't have a good sense. It feels in stream. It feels about like connection, connecting people and stuff like that. But I also feel like it could go really, really bad. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually working on a dating app right now. Um, I'm doing consulting and basically um, helping an individual who, who has the idea to bring it into reality. So getting a wireframe and things like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know what Facebook's doing. And I think, I think right now is if you're going to create a dating app is, is a good time to do it because uh, Tinder I don't use it myself, but I know that it sucks for my friends. And Bumble, it sucks. I mean, I think these were great platforms to meet people on initially when they were being used for their intentional purpose. But now I think it's gotten oversaturated. There's a lot of fake stuff going on. There's a lot of advertising going on. Yeah. So if Facebook were to execute on a dating, a dating app, it would probably do well right now. Mm -hmm. Just because I think there's kind of a need in the market. But what you said about um, the origin... Theory, have you read the book 21, 20, is it 21 or 22, Immutable Laws of Marketing? Yeah. Okay, so that's I like law know. number one or law number two is like uh, you have to own a name or a word in the prospect's head, which is like, you know, Xerox or Coca-Cola, like all these companies, like they really just, they're Coca-Cola, like it does one thing really, really well and it's a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar company. So like exactly like that, Google, you can't overcomplicate things because then people like, they're like, well, what does this company do? It does too many things. I don't know. You know, it's too, people is, is terrible as it is to say, people are extremely simple and incapable of handling complex theory on a yeah. mass scale. So you yeah. have to have things broken down, like just black and white. It has to be that way. So yeah. I think for, yeah, you got to just like one thing, pick it, you want to do something else get another idea and brand it, open up a new LLC, start with that. And you can have this company feed the new one, but you can't have this company break off and be another one. Yeah. And so yeah, I totally agree. And there's, there's a few companies that did just a modification of what you said, because I agree they are the parent, but you really don't know about them mm -hmm. in a sense. And they have brands underneath yeah. and, and that's the same concept, like originate the brand, originate the idea, let that own the space in the client's mind. And that's an awesome book. I'm glad you read it. Um, Cause it's like own the category, own the name in your space, and then you'll be fine. And I heard somebody tell me something the other day and I don't remember the source of it, but it, it rang true. It was, we can really only hold like four things in our head at once, like as entrepreneurs or business owners or folks on thing. And, and I think entrepreneurs think differently than everybody else. And like you said, just for general people or general conversation or day-to-day -day life, I operate like a regular consumer outside of my business world. And so I can't remember one more than one thing. So like if I'm going somewhere and I'm going to do one thing, but I'm supposed to stop and do something else, I always forget about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's the same, same thing like you said. It's like we can only hold so much in our head. And so you need to identify clearly and then you'll be fine. And so, yeah, it could very, very true. Yeah. That's why uh, for me, like one of the things that I've, done that is like taking me to the next level is like organizing like crazy mofo like my calendar has everything blocked out whether it's like send proposal out or it's like that shit has to go in there otherwise i get way too distracted and i forget yep. yeah. <laughs> me too i live out of my calendar it's the only organizational system and to-do system that i've consistently used for years i have other stuff around and i write stuff down in random places and i've tried project management stuff it's, if it's in my calendar i do it and I especially do it in my calendar if it's I show up and do it with another person because life is relational and it's much easier to accomplish things, you know, when you're when you act like that. So yeah, that's very yeah. very true. Yeah. And what I wish Google would do is create something better for like managing workflows. Like there's like Asana, Trello, all these things that are really great. I haven't really found anything that Google offers yet that I've been like super impressed with. And so I just go back to like blocking out my calendar with like, you know, an hour of time right here to accomplish this, 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 and this. Yep. And so, Keep it simple, right? <laughs> my grandpa, long before technology and, you know, he, he like taught himself to read and write. And so he barely could read and write, but 
he would just wake up in the morning and write down 20 things he was going to do. And he just worked, it was way down the list. And it's like, he was one of the most productive, successful people I've ever known. And it's, you know, he just kept it simple. <laughs> you heard that, um, that I guess say whatever, like do it, date it, delegate or dump it. Uh, similar ones, not that one, but yeah. <laughs> one of my mentors always says, do it, date it, delegate or dump it. And it's like, when you go through your list, you have too much to do. That's how you f- should figure it out. It I like it. Just dump it. Sometimes there's things on my, ca- on my schedule or my calendar. I'm like, I have so much to do today. I look at it. And I'm like, this is, does not need to be done really at all. Or I'll pay someone else to do it. Yeah. No, that's, that's excellent advice. It's definitely, definitely good. You got to unload your net. You're always going to want to do more than is possible. Right. So that's, that's an excellent model for, for, de- you know, delegating or getting rid of things too, for sure. Yeah. Hey, do you do, um, I imagine you have some sort of team or management that you're doing. Um, mm-hmm. So my, my business is a question for you. Maybe like you give me advice. Uh, my business has grown to the point where I have um, myself, my co-founder and then five other people that are working with us, um, whether they're like kind of W9 contracting in and out, but they're on a regular basis or actually people who are actually like going to be a part of Zima. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm trying to figure out the best way to organize everything for everyone. Um, so give you a little bit of background. I had some like video work, a video project that, um, I needed it to be done at a certain time. And the video team that I was using, um, which is some younger guys here in Seattle that started a business, they do a really great job. Um, they're 18 and 19. So I totally support them. And like, I feel like the reason why it didn't get executed properly was because I didn't set the expectations right. And so I'm wondering, you know, what do you do in order to make sure that everything is clear cut? Because um, obviously it was clear to me what I needed, but I didn't advocate that to them. So when mm-hmm. I did it down here, I look at myself and say, you know, what, did I, what can I do better? Um, how do you make sure that you're advocating everything to everybody? Do you have like a team planner that you use or do you send out like emails with project deadlines? What do you find works best? So the way you asked the question, you were asking for like logistical strategy, which I'm going to answer in a minute but there's a more important question to ask. And that is, is this person self-motivated and responsible and responsive? Okay. And so the way that I determine that before I even bother having a conversation with anybody um, is I'll give an example out of one of my com- one of my products copywriter today. If you want to come write for me, we had 500 applications last year to become a writer for our team. And it's like, we don't even advertise it. It's just known around different circles and whatever. And it, once in a, twice a year, I like may throw something out if I want to spike it or something, but it just, it organically, we have people apply mm-hmm. in the front of the funnel. It's a hiring funnel in front of the funnel. It's like, give me your name, information and a writing sample. It looks like a super simple form. Like anybody could take fill out in 15 seconds. So they fill it out and then it says, Hey, congrats. You've completed step one. You're not done yet. <laughs> and then they have to, they watch a video they have to go through and read our operations guide and then they have to click through to the next page and they have to write two sample pieces for me. And on that page, it says you need to complete this within 24 hours to be considered. And it also says you can do one or two 400 word samples. And the, the, those two pieces are really key. Um, one is that they complete within 24 hours because it, when I, I get, I don't know how many that is a day. We get a few a day. Um, When I'm evaluating their work, I also evaluate when they hit the front page and when they hit the last page and completed the work because that's level of responsiveness and urgency. Right. Then the second piece I look at is I typically don't hire them if they only wrote me one sample because they only did, they didn't go above and beyond and give me two. Like I kind of nudged them and said, Hey, it'd be nice to have two. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I'm sharing that because if you, if you kind of let people organically act in the way that they're going to act in an automated manner before you choose to deal with them, then you'll have a good sense of how they operate normally, which is really key to the problem that you're trying to solve. Okay. Um, And then I, I also, I judge everybody in my world, especially professionally, but personally too, unfortunately, I judge everybody in my world by how fast they respond to me. Yeah. Yeah. So I emailed you last night because I had my, my assistant had to resign. I'm hiring a new one. So I'm like dealing with my own shit. <laughs> and I emailed you last night and I'm like, Hey, this is what we're doing. And I'm going to send you a zoom link and you email me right back. Yeah. Um, and then you you followed up today too. 
It said like, cool, thanks, which was good because I had forgotten to send you the link. <laughs> I was just waiting for it. Actually, that's funny. I'm glad that I emailed you because um, last night I was, I was not home. I was actually out with my girlfriend um, and I was on my phone. I don't have my phone email signature set up yet. It's super kind of a stupid thing, but I was like, I was like, well, maybe I'll just email him when I get home because uh, I have my email signature set up and it just looks more business professional and everything. And I was like, no, screw it. I'm just going to do it right now. So I emailed you back on the spot. If I would have not emailed you on the spot, I probably would have not done it till this morning. So I'm really glad that I just got yeah. it. Yeah, and I was totally toying with canceling the interview because I've got some really high stake stuff that I'm working on and knocking out. And like, this is not something that I get paid for, right? I, it's one of my favorite things I do, but it's also not, it's not in priority with cash-based stuff. So if somebody's not super responsive, sometimes I just dump it. And if somebody ever cancels on me twice, like I canceled on you, I apologize the first time. But <laughs> um, if somebody cancels on me twice, they can't come on. That's yeah. it. Because it's like, a, you're not responsive. You're not respecting the timeline. You're not doing what you should be doing. So to answer your question, first, screen people the right way to get a real sense for how they operate. Second, be very clear about what you want out of it. Do your whole brain dump of like, here's what I want and blah, 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 blah. And then say, okay, Ben, can you share with me what's important on this project for us to be successful? Mm -hmm. And if it's quality of work, then if that's your priority and it's not the deadline, then you'll hear that. If it's really deadline driven and they don't bring up the deadline or say, hey, I'm going to try to deliver early or whatever, then they haven't absorbed the urgency that you had with it. It sounds like they didn't understand the urgency of the timeline or the, or the type of work or whatever you needed. And so it's really key to have them reiterate back to you until they get it. Until, and, and you know all the body language to see if they are getting it, right? So, so um, never assume and, and always use what you said earlier about how you teach your little brother and your clients how to do Facebook the right way. That's how I teach all my webinars too. Like just simple stories. Cause it's like the platform's there. You don't need that. You need it. You need to understand it. So always teach in stories. And I teach um, two different types of stories. I teach the, that's when I fucked it all up story and that was horrible. And here's what came out of it. And this is when, you know, so-and-so on my team was a hero and killed it for me. And I liked that. And I just choose one based on what I, in, in the moment, what I think is right. Yeah. Um, so is that helpful? Yeah, that is very helpful. Uh, definitely the screening process. Um, I think that's important to have the system developed. For me, I have a lot of systems in my business within servicing clients, you know, procedures for getting people onboarded or launching campaigns or ordering outsourced products, whatever it is. Uh, but when it comes to hiring people, you know, that's a new, totally new, I've, it was just me and Brennan for two, two years and a month mm -hmm. just, and no one else came in. And so now that, you know, we're two and a half years and we have people coming in um, and it, it's needed. We need them in the business to continue growing at the rate that we are, but also have no process for that. So, I'm like, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's part of it. Yep. There's another, there's, have you heard of the rule of three and 10? No, I haven't. The rule of three and 10 says that when you triple and when you 10 X, everything you're doing will break. Okay. And that's what you're experiencing right now. Cause you went from two to six or seven. So the normal way for you and that not break or whatever, but it's just like a new reinvention of the company or, or things do break. So the normal way that you're operating, of course doesn't work cause you just totally imploded your social structure in your company <laughs> yeah, exactly. in a good way. But it, I mean, but that's what happens with it. Um, and then the other thing I was like, going to say, Oh, there's, there's, no, there's no hard and fast rule, but um, typically people can only manage like six to 10 people under them. So just pay attention as you grow and make sure that um, you, you know, you're just paying attention to ratios. And then one last thing, and then we won't go ramble on forever, but this has been a blast, um, is founders, one of the founders is typically a visionary and then one founder is typically an implementer when you have two, when you have co-founders. So just be aware of that dynamic. But what's going to happen is as you guys scale up, <clears throat> you're going to need other implementers. So I just hired what I'm calling an internal consultant a couple of weeks ago to be my implementer. It's the best thing in the world because it lifted all this pressure off me and I'm just the visionary now. So yeah. pay attention in your teams. There's visionary, there's implementer, then there's operations because there's a, there's a huge step between your head 
and the people doing it. And in your scenario, you're a little bit small and in some senses to have an implementer, but if you had an implementer between you and the video guys, you probably would have been more successful too. And it's, it's not a project manager. It's an implementer. Um, and read the book, uh, traction. You'll love it. I'll check that out. I appreciate that. And then the other <laughs> book, what was the other, uh, author you're talking about for body language? And- Kevin Mitnick. I can't remember the name of his book, but just look up Kevin Mitnick. Um, his business card is, is, a um, it's a, not that you would, but this will help you remember His business card is a lock pick. You can take it apart and pick locks with it. So wow. that's a unique business card. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Have you met him in person? Huh? Have you met him in person and gotten his no. card? No, I've just, I've just seen it on the internet and read about him and followed him around to see what he's doing. He's got, read his, read his first book first and then read them, you know, obviously, but read his first book first. It's his personal story. It's amazing. Okay. I absolutely will. I love to read. So I'll pick up all three or, you know, the Kevin Minnick and the Traction. Yep. Very cool. cool. Well, thanks so much for being on, Ben. This is a blast. I definitely want to have you back. Um, thanks to everybody that tuned in. Yeah, thank you. And... Oh, here's the title because Zach is awesome. Um, it's Ghostwire. Let me click the link here. Yeah, it's a. It's like Ghost Wires or something. Yeah, the link is looking weird. I'll pull it up for you, but it's in the comments there. Okay. Um, but anyway, thanks. Uh, thank you everybody for tuning in. If you like this, um, comment and share. If you're on Facebook, that would mean a lot. And definitely follow Ben. He's amazing. And uh, if you're listening to this on uh, iTunes or YouTube, we always appreciate your likes and your five-star reviews so that we can keep doing this. That's what motivates me. And I love having conversations like this. So thank you so much, Ben. Thank you, Gabe. I really appreciate it. Have a good day. You've been listening to Today's Business Leaders with Gabe Arnold. Remember to subscribe on iTunes. For more information, visit todaysbusinessleaders.com.